Partiz in Chicago sitting down with radical activist, author, and former professor Villers. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. So let's get started with uh, protests really in the United States. We've seen the Arab Spring, we've seen the uprisings in Europe, we've seen Occupy Wall Street in the United States. Who do you think is really the face of the modern protester in the U.S. today? Well, I mean, I think Occupy is this unpredictable but wonderful development, and it comes directly out of the Arab Spring. I mean, it, the, the idea that people could actually make a difference is, is infectious. And so Occupy came out of Madison. Madison came out of Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square came out of Bradley Manning and WikiLeaks. So we kind of can see a, a, a real development where people are saying, you know, the world as it is is not the world as it must be. It could be otherwise. And when people feel that way, they get into motion, get into action. Very exciting, very, you know, hopeful. We have obviously critics of Occupy Wall Street who say the main flaw of the movement is a lack of a tangible unified message. Do you think that kind of message exists apart from the obvious Occupy Wall Street? What is it really about? Well, I think people are mistaken in, uh, with that kind of criticism. Occupy is not a point of arrival. It's not a manifesto. It's not a demand. Occupy is an invitation and it's an opening of the public space. That means that every grievance, every complaint, as well as every aspiration and dream can find a place in a new open uh, public square. I think Occupy already has accomplished um, something amazing, which is has shifted the frame on how we discuss wealth, how we discuss war, how we discuss austerity. The metaphor, 1%, 99% is a marvelous metaphor. But as usual, power responds to these kinds of upheavals in, in a pattern that, that is predictable. They ignored Occupy for a while, then they ridiculed it, then they tried to co-opt it with language like, what's your demand? And, and then they beat it up, and then they repeated. That's very typical of how these things happen, but Occupy has not gone away. It's morphed, it's transformed. So Occupy is a marvelous thing and it's still evolving and we shall see. Occupy also seems to have brought sort of police violence and arrest that we haven't seen in a while in the United States. And every time there's clashes, like we saw here in Chicago, it seems to be the protesters saying the police are violent, the police are saying the protesters are violent. Who is right? What we see in our whole society is the militarization of our society. So when NATO comes together, for example, for a summit, um, this is an organization all wearing suits and ties, all speaking very quietly, but they, they represent three quarters of the military budget in the world. Three quarters are represented by the, the NATO kind of G8 world. And, and that's violence, that's institutional violence. So in Chicago, when there were clashes between um, NATO demonstrators and police, um, we have to also note that the city was incredibly militarized. That is, there were tens of thousands of police in the streets, gear that nobody had ever seen before, you know, troop carriers, buses transformed into military vehicles. We take for granted in this country that the military must be under civilian control. If it's not under civilian control, it's a dictatorship. Well, what is NATO under? How is NATO governed? Who takes care of making sure that it's not a military dictatorship. And the problem is, in many ways it is. Obviously people are quite annoyed, to say the least, with the fact that, like you say, millions are spent on a summit, billions are spent abroad on wars, uh, whereas obviously a lot of people are still not in the best economic situation. Do you think, I mean, what is this all about? Is there a huge disconnect between those in power and the people, or is this kind of purpose, something that's purposefully being done? Instead? Well, I think both are true, but is there a huge disconnect? Absolutely. What is NATO if it's not kind of a fig leaf for the United States? NATO in Europe, for example, um, has 260 tactical nuclear weapons. Those are not allowed under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but they're allowed because NATO is not a signatory. It's a way around the law. It's a way around common sense. But speaking of a disconnect, yes, there is a disconnect. 27% of Americans support the war in Afghanistan, and we can't end it. This has been true now for seven years. No one wants it. 11 years ago when the war started, we could have said this is a police action to get the people who did 9-11. But no, it was an invasion and a war. We overthrew a government. Where are we 11 years later? They're now talking about negotiating with the Taliban. 
they, and, and moving out of Afghanistan, but leaving $4 billion a year in American aid. That's an outrage, and it should be an outrage. That's why only 27 percent still support that war. But we cannot end it. That's a disconnect between power and the people. The first time we interviewed you, four years ago, uh, you said you wanted to create the biggest anti-war movement in the U.S. Are you closer to that? Is Occup Occupy Wall Street part of that? The energy of Occupy is in part an anti-war energy. It's an energy that says our priorities are all messed up. Our society is off the tracks. Spending trillions on war uh, every couple of years while we ignore basic human needs, privatizing the public space, um, destroying the, the electoral process under the term reform, reforming everything from public schools to elections um, to pensions. And what reform is, is a kind of a cover for destruction. So yes, I think that the anti-war movement is represented in the Occupy moment. And my hope is that we continue to evolve and grow. Do you think with the wars the U.S. is fighting, it's uh, living sort of beyond its means? Can it really sustain those wars? Absolutely not. And, and, and you know, one of the things that happened to the old Soviet Union was it spent itself into destruction. I mean, you cannot arm at this level and, and have now create the conditions for an arms war with China, with India, with Russia, with all the, the countries of South Asia. That's an outrage that we are now entering into a new arms race, which is going to spend us into a catastrophe. It's anti-democratic. It's not what people want. It's not how we want to see ourselves. And it's something that has to end. What do you think about the U.S. and NATO missile defense plans? Is that necessary? Absolutely unnecessary. I mean, if you think of all the toys and gimmicks and, and, and war materials that are being developed, what are they for? I mean, why 150 American military bases abroad? What are they doing? Who are they encircling? So now it gives itself permission for preemptive war, for war against non-state actors, which can take the form of any country it wants to invade. So NATO in Afghanistan, NATO in Iraq, NATO in Libya. These are illegal, immoral, and unnecessary moves. We're hearing war drums beating over Iran lately, a lot. Do you think uh, we'll see the U.S. embark on this new military escapade? It would be a catastrophe for everyone if the, if the United States or NATO, which is just the United States fig leaf, or Israel went into Iran and attacked Iran. There, we can live in this world as a nation among nations as long as we insist on the old colonial mentality that we can dominate other peoples, we can tell them how to be, and have a double standard that's just so grotesque. So we're frantic about the possibility that Iran might have a nuclear warhead someday. Meanwhile, we have 2,000 nuclear warheads, and that doesn't make us frantic. Israel is the third largest nuclear power in the world, not part of nuclear nonproliferation and not part of uh, even admitting that they have them. This is a world that's dangerous, that's, you know, unstable, but it's not unstable because of Iran. There are so many better ways to be a citizen of the world than to shake your sword every time you feel like it. The U.S. has a, the biggest military budget in the world. A trillion dollars a year. What is really the necessity. We understand that if somebody attacks you, you have to be ready to defend yourself. But considering many people and critics of U.S. warmongering say the U.S. actually starts these wars, it by itself builds this long list of enemies. Well, that's my view. My view is that if you look at my whole you know, lifetime, uh, 67 years, the U.S. has been engaged in a war virtually every year. And the wars are primarily wars of invasion and aggression and occupation. Vietnam, we can all now look back and say, well, that was illegal, immoral, uh, a tragedy. Three million people were killed, 6,000 a week were killed in that unnecessary war, mostly civilians, and the U.S. did it. I mean, it, it, it made it happen under a lot of guises of bringing democracy and so on. Uh, there was a wonderful sign in the demonstrations recently that said, you know, if you want to build democracy someplace, build it here. And I think that's true. Peace is the answer, and it begins here. We have to cut back our military budget. We have to close our foreign military bases. We have to become a nation among ni nations, not the uber nation exerting our will everywhere. We have the U.S. elections fast approaching. Four years ago, a lot of people in the U.S. were really hopeful that Barack Obama would become sort of the real face of change. A lot of Americans now say that that has not happened. Democrats and Republicans seem to be the same side of one coin. What should we 
expect? Is it naive at this point for anybody to expect some real true change come elections, regardless of who wins those elections? I think we have to build a movement for change. I think that's what brings change. If you look back even in our fairly recent history, it wasn't Lyndon Johnson, although Lyndon Johnson passed the most far-reaching civil rights legislation in history, he wasn't part of the black freedom movement. He was responding. Franklin Roosevelt wasn't part of the labor movement, and yet he accomplished all that labor legislation and social legislation. And Abraham Lincoln didn't belong to an abolitionist party. Each of them was responding to movements on the ground. What we need if we want peace is to build a movement on the ground that can bring about real change from the bottom, and that's what I think we should be concerned about. During the last presidential elections, obviously your name was talked about a lot by the mainstream media. What do you think is going to be the main controversy this time around? The one thing that we know for sure is that money is always corrupting in politics, not just here, but in Russia and Europe, everywhere. Money corrupts politics. This election season in the United States is going to see uh, an absolute tidal wave of cash come into this election. So last time out, the Obama campaign spent a half a billion dollars. This time, each campaign will spend over a billion. And it's hard to believe that anyone can look at that and say, this is what democracy looks like. I think it's what plutocracy looks like. Rich people throwing cash around, buying votes, buying legislators, and it's uh, an unseemly and, and certainly undemocratic site. I have no idea what the controversy will be, but you can be sure it'll be dirty and it'll be expensive.